Good morning. morning. Welcome. I'd like to welcome folks who are joining us online as well and uh, ask that we share this wave of Christ and greeting in the name of Jesus Christ with one another and wave to that camera where folks can see us, greeting them from wherever they are online today. We know you're with us. We've got a number of things happening, refreshments following service, courtesy of Kathy Daniels. Uh, Appreciate that. And I'm going to turn things right over to Sharon, who has a word. Oh. There you go. As you noticed on the altar this morning, there's a couple plants. This is from the choir to Scott and Linda for everything you've gone through with us this year. We couldn't do it without either one of you, and we pray and hope that we'll be able to start this up again in September. Amen. And we're inviting our leaders to take those home with them following service, right? That's nice. I heard you had a big ice cream party last Thursday, too. (laughs) You know? Well, that was nice. So we'll look forward to September. We appreciate your leadership. Church school today. uh, We're going to start right at 11 or by 11 and ask that folks understand that. uh, If you would like to join us up in the Fireside Room will close at 11.45. I'm committed to help some people in several ministry things today, so need to keep moving. Uh, Forest Glen, in one of those activities today, 2 p.m. out at the retirement community. We sing some songs. I take some song sheets. We read some scripture together and pray. So join us at 2, if you'd like, out at the Forest Glen um, facility. I'll ask you to look at the activities for the week in your bulletin, and I also have a couple of special notes to add, some nice things happening. Dwajak Music in the Park, this is at the library, we say the library pavilion, I guess that's what it is, isn't it? Uh, It starts this Thursday, June 13th, you know, with the evening, Thursday evening music groups this week. It will be a double feature. Redbud Ramblers and, if I may say, the real reason I want to get behind this is the Dwajak Union High School Chamber Choir. Amen. So Thursday, the Ramblers go first, then Hunter, and then uh, your your musicians. Oh, excuse me. Okay. So 7.30 then, we want to be there right away to catch the choir. And We've got some uh, young people, related uh, grandchildren and relatives of those of us here. So if you want to support the young folks and Hunter, be there under the pavilion or next to the pavilion at 7.30 Thursday. Uh, Food trucks start at 6. So you could get a get your meal, music seven thirty. Uh, special announcement for this week: Becky Peters will be out of the office this week. She and Dan will be making a quick visit to see Jared uh, serving in the Marine Corps in North Carolina. And you can contact Becky by email or by her cell phone number if you have it. What this means is. Ordinarily, I'm in the office Tuesday and Wednesday, 9 to noon, each of those two days, and then Becky has the more full schedule in the office. I will be committed to be here Tuesday, 9 to noon, Wednesday, 9 to noon. I can't cover all the other hours because I need to be out working with us and for us, but you can count on me to be here Tuesday morning, 9 to noon, Wednesday morning, 9 to noon. And then... We'd like to share a report before Bob uh, gets us into the formal leadership of worship time. Share a report from the Michigan Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. I'll say a quick word, and then Gloria Staten is our member 
uh, from the congregation who re uh, represents our church. This is the Michigan uh, area. It's actually called an area in a formal term of the United Methodist Church. There are about 130,000 United Methodist Christians in Michigan, and that represents uh, about 650 individual congregations. And um, of course, corresponding number of pastors that serve those and lay members. So there are about 1,200 people that uh, are sent to Traverse City once a year to be a part of this conference. And Gloria is going to share about this year's meeting. Good morning. Well, I wish I'd written this all out, but you're going to get it from my notes. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to begin by thanking you for allowing me the privilege of representing you uh, at this year's Michigan Annual Conference in Traverse City. Um, we were blessed with inspiring music, uh, liturgical dance, um, shared communion, uh, and many messages based on this year's theme, which was fearless, embracing a new future. Um, let's see, we, we voted uh, to accept this year's budget, which is 8.4% less than last year's budget. Uh, some of the other things that we voted on after lively discussion on both sides of each issue, which was polite and we listened to one another. <laughs> um, resolution nine, witnessing and voting for civility, compassion and democracy. And we also passed resolution six, which was a call for peace with justice in the Middle East. Um, let's see. Sorry about this. Oh. Um, if you have an opportunity, there is a summary video that is on the Michigan uh, conference site uh, by um, Bishop Bard, and it's absolutely excellent. A uh, couple of the things he said was that uh, the United Methodist Church has become more spacious because we made space for more persons to participate um, in the life and mission of our church. Uh, it's time to renew ourselves with fearlessness and have the courage to take risks for missions. Uh, and then we had speakers who talked about um, a fresh Pentecost in the Methodist Church. Uh, sounding off of alarms, she said, um, creating confusion and concern. And thus, the bishop and the other speakers encouraged us to go through the experience, but to be fearless, which just means less fear. Uh, and I think during Sunday school I can talk more about this, but uh, he referred to, I, I, I'm trying to, oh, this is how we vote. We hold these up, and the bishop does an amazing job of counting. He just uh, estimates, and he's pretty amazing. Um, the first opening sermon by the bishop was called Pantophobia, and that is the fear of everything, as explained by Lucy to Charlie Brown. <laughs> so on that, I think I will close and perhaps talk to you during Sunday school. Thank you, Gloria. One of the most amazing moments in this annual conference, remember 650 or so local churches all over Michigan. The annual conference people, the leadership, chose three of the 650, three churches to highlight their ministries. We are one of the three. So, so as much as it was important to hear from the standard leadership, the real story for me was the way this congregation is doing ministry and the way the leadership 
is, is encouraged by you. There's a, a four minute video Dan is going to play about one of our projects uh, in the Dwajak area. So Dan, if you could do that, we'll close on that and then Bob after the video. Thank you. In the heart of Dwajak, Michigan, a local United Methodist Church is on a journey to change lives in their community during the season of Lent. Reverend Dr. Christopher Mominy and his congregation felt a need to engage with communities in their region, so they offered a Lenten book study at their local library based on his recently published book, Compelling Lives, the story of five people of the broader Methodist movement who stood up for human dignity. Simply doing it in the library sends a message that our congregation is engaged in a community at large, that we feel that we are members with everyone else who is a member of this community. It gives us a chance to have people both from the congregation and others just from the community to come be a part of things. Even library employees found themselves drawn to the church's inclusive approach. One of the church members um, was attending a book club that I ran at the library. And um, at that point, I wasn't going to church. I was a Christian, but I had a lot of church wounding. And um, so I wasn't currently attending. And Roberta was actually talking about church and God and everything and I kind of gave her a little bit of a hard time and I asked her some hard questions and she answered in a very loving manner and she says but you know what let me check with my pastor and I will get back with you and um, Pastor Chris showed up the next day at the library and talked to me personally and I was so impressed by that I watched his online service and then I attended the following week, and I haven't left since. For those attending from other denominations and other communities, the book study exemplified the work of Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people that go to church, but they have no understanding of who the Holy Spirit is. They've never had a, an encounter with Jesus Christ. And, and so today, people cross denominational lines are coming together and talking and sharing. And I think the more we have people talking and sharing, regardless of the denomination is, I believe there's one church, one body, one, one faith, one baptism, one Lord. Through intentional outreach efforts, the church has bridged the gap between faith and community and welcomed all people where they are. For Gina, the church's unwavering love and acceptance led her to become a member on Easter Sunday. My brother is a gay. And um, I came from a background where they weren't loving towards that. And I asked Pastor Chris, I said, what would happen if I brought my brother to church? How would he be treated? And his answer to me was, we would love him and we would accept him. And I was just like, wow. And I think what what Chris has done is open the door for a lot of people to come and fellowship and harmony. That's kind of what I like about what's going on here. Through their actions, this small church exemplified the true essence of community, listening, embracing diversity, and spreading love, exemplifying what so many people need today. Find what needs to be done and do it for Jesus and the kingdom. In the end, it's not the walls that define a church, but the spirit of inclusivity and compassion that it embodies. And in Dwajak, Michigan, this spirit continues to thrive, lighting the way for all who seek belonging and acceptance. Well, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Gloria mentioned something about liturgical dance. Is that what you call it? Liturgical, liturgical. 
I hope you practiced. And that's not the littered gist, right? I'm just <laughs> double checking. There will be no there will be no dancing this morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. We will be reading this responsively. Eternal God, you gave to your apostles many excellent gifts. For all these gifts given and used in your name. We give thanks, O oh God. Come upon us gathered here. Call and equip us. So that we may do justice, love, mercy, and walk humbly with you. Please remain standing for the opening hymn. We'll be singing all five verses of number 73. O oh, worship the King. seated. Join me in the opening prayer. God is calling, and we will read this in unison. From within and outside the stillness of your creation, speak to us, Lord, and hear us as we speak to you from the depths of our despair to the height of our joys. We look to you for strength and comfort. Hear our praises, thanksgivings, and intercessions as we continually call upon you. Help us appreciate your glory, mercy, and grace that we may allow your love to enter our hearts and enable us to give to others, just as you have gifted us. Almighty God, be with us and in us. Open our hearts that we may listen and hear your call. Amen. Our first reading is from Genesis 18, 1 through 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre 
as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near them, hear him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abram hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season and in your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age, and had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I be fruitful? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, yes, you did laugh. Our second reading is Ephesians 4, 9 through 13. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above the heavens, so that he might fill all things. He himself granted that some are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. Now the chancel choir will sing, You'll Never Walk Alone.
Please stand for the reading of the gospel. From Matthew 4, 18 through 22. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. Immediately they threw their nets, left their nets, and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two older brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called to them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. What a terrific interlude piece for what we're doing here. Wow, I have decided to follow Jesus. Oh gosh, let's pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I've shared before... Um, ways in which my first wife, Kim, uh, struggled uh, many, many years with a variety of serious health issues before she died in 2016. In 2004, Kimmy was 39 years old, and she developed a disease called pulmonary hypertension. And it's um, a disease where the heart uh, has a kind of constriction in its, in its uh, major arteries, and it won't basically pump uh, enough oxygen through your system. And so it becomes a kind of long-term heart failure. And it, up until probably not too many years before she developed the disease, it was definitely considered a fatal disease, affected younger women uh, more than any other population. And yet uh, we did find someone who could help at the University of Michigan Hospital. Now, that's not why I'm telling you about that episode in our lives, but um, the only option at that time was to take a drug called Flowland and to have a pump, which is, um, you know, that you wear outside of your body and then the, um, the tube for the medicine goes directly into your, your heart, basically. So there's a procedure for, you know, inserting the port in, into the line that goes directly into the heart, and then every day Kimmy had to mix her medicine in a sterile field and pour it in this thing and, and all of that. But it did eventually help her and gave her uh, some more years, uh, among other things, to her life. But I remember just how tough it was for her to come up against that when she had other things, you know, that she wanted to do in her life to serve God. And, and all of a sudden, whew, right, something like that just pulls a rug out from under your feet. And many of us have had that experience. Uh, we went to the University of Michigan for the procedure to... Uh, prepare the port and all of that, and, and she was really low, and I kept, you know, trying to encourage her, and I'll be right here, we're going to be okay, you know, this is okay, and uh, one of the medical people noticed just how much 
kind of emotional distress she was in, sat down with her and said, if you don't mind, I'll tell you a quick story. And, yeah, okay, I mean, we're not going anywhere, right? So, <laughs> um, and he said, I used to be a fighter, a firefighter. And he was still a relatively young man, but he said, I used to be a firefighter, and I loved, you know, being able to help folks. It had a lot of risks to it. You know, we work hard. Many of you have, are, are firefighters or have been, and we're blessed to have some of the leaders in our area in terms of that ministry. And this young fellow said, one day, um, it was a bad fire, and a wall fell on me. He said, I just couldn't be a firefighter anymore. The injuries and everything, the, the disabilities just kept me from doing that safely for other people. He said, I had to figure out what I was going to do and be. Everything got pulled out from under me. He said, so I got into this. <laughs> and he became um, a technician, a medical technician to help people with heart problems. And he, he didn't dwell on it, but you could tell that it had become a very fulfilling and satisfying thing for him. Uh, another woman in, uh, in my life who has since passed away, a, a woman who is a mother of a bride, her husband had died a year or so before, and I remember she said, you don't always get your first choice in life. And I remember that because that spoke to me over the years. And it might speak to you. So what do we do when we think, you know, certain things that made sense to us, that we thought this was going to be a way to serve God, or this, this is how, it, you know, I kind of figured it would go, and, and I could make a life of service for the Lord, and it, it, it had purpose, and, you know, all of that. What happens when something like that gets just taken away, you know? And... The overall message I like to share is the Lord always has a powerful way to surprise you with a new and maybe shocking call to ministry. So we're going to talk about Sarah today, Abraham and Sarah, but mostly Sarah today. Now the background to the story uh, most of us know, but it's okay if you're not familiar with it, I'll, I'll kind of give you the thumbnail sketch. Abram and Sarai were a couple very, very early in the Genesis, well, anything in Genesis is very, very early, but um, this isn't necessarily the beginning of Genesis, but they are, of course, the, the, the grandparents, if you will, of a whole tradition. And their names change to Abraham and Sarah. There's some uh, lead up to chapter 18 that talks about Abraham and Sarah, particularly in chapter 17, and then you get the full-blown version of the story in chapter 18 that Bob read, where Abraham is out uh, and meets three mysterious characters, right? And he provides for them, and Sarah provides for them in hospitality, food preparation, and all of this. And we're, you know, scholars like to shut the door in a closed room and argue over whether one of the characters represented God or God was in the mix of all three of them. And, you know, you can find texts that... Anyway, God was in that mix of three people, right? This was God showing up in, in some kind of human form uh, before the days of Jesus, of course. And lo and behold, God promises that Sarah will have a child. Now, that's not too shocking, unless you're 90 years old, right? So there's an impossible thing set up here, and there's a language to the story that basically uh, challenges Abraham and Sarah, both of them, that, well, you know, what is impossible with God? You know, that kind of refrain. We see it in other scripture passages and up into the New Testament writings that with God, you know, everything's possible. Which is another way of saying, uh, look out, you, you ain't, you know, you don't know what's coming, and uh, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, be fearless. There's something good that God can do in your life at whatever stage, right? So I wanted us to make note of the role of hospitality 
when these three folks came around. There was a kind of preparation and openness. So how do you prepare your heart, right, to receive the wild, ridiculous promise of ministry in your life? Pre preparation is important. And then, of course, there is this theme of the blessing. You know, the child is, is traditionally understood as a blessing in Hebrew tradition and in many modern traditions. A child is a blessing. But the blessing comes as a shock, right? Have you ever been blessed and you wondered, mm, maybe somebody else can be blessed next time? Right? Okay. But it is a blessing. It's a shocking blessing. So let me move now to what I would call a contrast between assumptions in our lives, how God's going to work, how God's going to call us, what God's going to figure out, you know, and get into our heads and hearts, assumptions and the blessing, the promise. First of all, of course, there is the age of Abraham and Sarah, right? Uh, I speak only with a little bit of metaphorical language when I say they have got to be the oldest parents of a newborn, right, that you could ever consider. And yet, this comes to them, both of them, but Sarah is focus of this story in many ways, as a blessing, right? And then there is the response. You knew I would have to address the response. Sarah does what? She laughs. Now, I'm speaking from my own sense of reading the scripture, prayer, and some interpretation, and a little bit of reading of so-called experts, but I don't read her laugh as an automatically terrible thing. And maybe it's because if I were in that position, what would I say? Oh, yes, Lord, this would be great. I understand it. It makes perfect sense. Are you kidding me? This thing is a shock and a surprise. And I have had pastor colleagues, I'm probably reacting to them a little bit here. I have pastor colleagues who say, and Sarah laughed, and therefore she bore a kind of judgment for laughing. I'm like, and you wouldn't laugh? Yeah. Right? Pastors are really, were really good about standing up in front of people and, and throwing out moral judgments, right? As if we wouldn't be in the same shoes. So, you know, this is God, for goodness sakes. God's heard it all, and God can deal with it and, you know, help the folks along. So she laughed. All right. Itzhak, laughter, whatever. Isaac, you know. But this is the response. And I mean no offense, but if there's somebody here who says, I wouldn't laugh, I would receive it as, as a holy moment. Come on. Come on. Okay. So lessons for today, just a few of them as I was wrestling with this. And I'm going to say some pretty candid things, um, and I hope you'll take them to heart. And in the end, there is a blessing. Okay? Um, let me ask a few questions. Number one, how often do we make assumptions about what can or cannot happen when God is involved? Do we make those assumptions? Yeah. Right? I do. It's human nature, you know. Um, assumptions of what can or can't happen. Now, I'm not getting into the particularities of biology and child rearing and bearing and, con you know, conception and all of this kind of stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about, generally speaking, right, we all make assumptions about what God can do in our lives at this point, you know, at this point. Secondly, do we sometimes try to recreate the past 
Why would I ask that question? Well, for this reason. The promise of children, to me, sometimes gets heard and discussed as a recreation of the past. Oh, remember when we had children? Right? The promise of children, young people, pitter-patter of little feet, obnoxious invasion of the refrigerator of bigger feet, right? The whole bit. And I'm going to be very candid and specific here. I hear it sometimes in our community. Oh, remember when we had the children? Okay. Don't do that. <laughs> Please. Do we see this promise as a recreation of the past, as a nostalgia? That I do not believe is what God has in mind here. After all, think of the story. Did Abraham and Sarah sit around and say, oh, remember all of our little children, and now we'll have another one, and it'll be just like it was in 1970, no. They have never had this experience before, and now they're going to have this ridiculously wonderful experience as a brand new promise in their lives. Just remember that. Okay? Remember that. God does not call us to live in the past. I'm a historian. Okay? I don't say that lightly. The other thing is, July 1st, I will begin my 38th year under appointment in United Methodist Ministry as an ordained pastor. I ain't a rookie, folks. I've had good years in ministry. I've had some tough years in ministry. And the years when everything probably seemed exciting and idyllic with the pitter-patter of little feet around the church took place during my very earliest years in ministry. Okay? It's a good memory. I have no interest in recreating that. And I... It's not because I don't like kids. I love kids. It's because God is doing something exciting now. You with me? Amen. Do not measure this congregation or any congregation against what it used to be like in 1980. Don't do it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. There's too much excitement going on right now and for the, our future that may include young people, I hope to goodness, but every time an older church person talks about recruiting younger people to a congregation, what they're saying is, I want that individual to recreate my memory and my agenda. It's disrespectful to the people themselves. Amen. Yes, I said that. Love people for who they are. Little ones, not so little ones. Getting on ones, older ones. Younger people do not exist to recreate our glory days. They have value, and they are a gift, and I am most excited to include and invite young and old alike, okay? But don't come to me. Don't come to me with some, oh, I wish we could do... Because in focusing on that as a memory... We miss the call of God today and tomorrow. Amen? Amen. And the last question I have is, how are we open to God's future? Future. 
I don't know about the future. Oh, I don't know. Look, the church doesn't need us to be Eeyore. Remember Eeyore? Eeyore, the Nonkey and the Winnie the Pooh series. Doesn't mean we're always smiley and happy. I get teased for sometimes not being the most outwardly exuberant person. I accept it. I can be a little melancholy. We all can. We're all different, right? But the future out of the present is an exciting time to live as part of the gospel. You with me? And I was going to close this sermon, as I often do, by coming up with a heartwarming story out there in the media somewhere because, you know, we get tired of the negative stuff and it makes sense to listen to the heartwarming stories. I was going to go out and find one about somebody in advanced years who had not been allowed to do a certain dream and who was called to do something late in life. See, this is the Sarah parallel. And was doing wonderful, exciting, worthwhile, purposeful ministry. I was going to come in with some story about, you know, Gladys McGillicuddy from Buffalo Breath, Iowa, and all of this. But, you know, that would have been insulting of me. You don't need me to bring in stories about people who have gone through highs and lows and ups and downs and heartbreak and have had to change plans because you are those people. And you're doing some of the most exciting ministry I've ever seen before in my life. Seriously. Don't you realize how cool you are? Right? That's the promissory side of all this. And I know sometimes it seems like God's got a veil over what we individually should be doing right now or could be doing. And it gets frustrating as we go through life and make changes and and retire or not retire or come up against tragic, you know, difficult circumstances of illness. But I got to tell you, I could not tell a story about people who have long life experience dealing with adversity, doing exciting things that came as ridiculous callings, wonderfully ridiculous. I couldn't do that any better than I can right here in this congregation in Dwajak, Michigan. I can't. And I'm not just trying to blow a warm and fuzzy, you know, encouragement at you. That's based in what I believe to be the truth. The truth, folks. The truth. And that's why my take, when I come back from something like the Michigan Conference of the United Methodist Church, which was really a good meeting as far as uh, getting along and hearing one another. 1,200 people. When I come back, my focus isn't, oh, I wish we could be like that. Oh, I wish we were like, I come back saying, huh, there's a reason out of 650 congregations, they chose three to have videos. And there's a reason you are one of them. With all of our imperfections and struggles. It's because... I don't go there to get inspired, folks. I stay here to be inspired. That is a fact. No disrespect intended. And when they say, wow, we want to do a video on this stuff in Dwajak, I say, well, you should. (laughs) No. (laughs) I'm grateful. It's nice they support us, and they send a whole crew down. But the fact of the matter is, exciting ministry is happening here with people who are 25, 29, 
35, 39, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, in their 90s. Right here. Right? That is the Sarah story. Be open to it. Be open to it. And enjoy it, even though it brings its own challenges. Amen. <clears throat> Please stand for the hymn of response. Jesus calls us, number 398 in the hymnal, all five verses. I've been asked to uh, share an announcement and a request that uh, when we have prayer time, of course, we have, uh, we make mention of folks that are having more recent, you know, joys or concerns, but on the back of the bulletin is a list of folks that for some time have been on our prayer list, and uh, it's important to be aware of them. The one uh, thing that I would ask is for all of us to take responsibility. And if there's someone who maybe doesn't need to be on the list right now or anymore, please let Becky Peters know in the office. We're not in the business of uh, moving people off of the prayer list, but we don't know if someone has, uh, hopefully, of course, you know, made a recovery or is doing better or I think so-and-so is okay for now, you can remove him or her. Uh, help us do that so we keep up to date on things, please. Uh, let me mention some folks we continue to pray for. Uh, Frank and Marcia Butts. Frank and Fran Skibby. Adele Straub. Mona Bowie. Kathy Hall. Bob and Patsy Meacham. And uh, some folks that maybe are dealing with more emergent kind of illnesses. Andy Anderson, who has been diagnosed with a, a long-term uh, health issue in our town. If you know Andy, uh, let him know you're thinking about him, please. He gave me permission to share and to have him in prayer. Um, Barb Groner, I, I didn't really ask you, so I'm sorry if I 
stepped over the line here, but Barb has got some ongoing health concerns that, so. And uh, Burl Silvernail. Burl is having a tough time. She uh, was having a tough time in Florida and it looked as if maybe things were stabilizing a little bit while they, um, while they dissolved a clot and some other things to prepare her for some care and that would really help her out. And she's taken a turn for the worse this week. So we're really sorry to report that. So be in prayer for Burl and her family and Troy and Katie and, and all the folks related to Burl. And prayers for our nation. Let's pray. Holy Lord God, move among us that as we face the, the struggle and the pain and the grief of so many things that we may hold to your promise that whether or not life delivers first choices or second choices or third or fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh choices, that you have an important call for us. Let us open ourselves to that, dear God, and move us to be in ministry with those named and those we are not able to name. We ask this in the name of Jesus our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time to return some of what we have been given. The offertory today is Savior like a shepherd lead us. The ushers will come forward during the doxology.
please stand for the doxology. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to offer, the fruit of our labor and the bounty of the skills you have given us. Take us and our possessions to do your work in the world. Amen. Please remain standing for the closing hymn, Here I Am, Lord, number 593. We will sing all three verses.
Go now and serve God in all that you do. And may God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost abide with you forever. Amen.